And this brings us to the moot court competition. And I will let uh, Dimitri Arnidis introduce it. He has done a fantastic job helping us organize this conference. He's an absolutely uh, superstar for us here. He took it so very seriously. And I was extremely surprised, even though I'm, I live and breathe this technology for the last 15 years. years. And I'm certain that we can determine fear and um, even truthfulness better than the current uh, lie detector tests. Dimitri took it really seriously and brought it into the idea of the court system and the legal process. So Dimitri, please uh, take it away. And I ask all the judges who have not renamed themselves and all the participants, please click on the three little dots on the top of your, um, uh, uh, of your icon where your face appears and scroll down and rename yourselves from a, a generic Osmocosm participant to your own name. So Dimitri, please take it away. You have uh, the full two hours and you have the floor. And uh, uh, just tell everybody that this is gonna be supremely entertaining, educational, and rigorous. It's the three things that we're going for. Entertaining means it's gonna engage your senses apart from your smile for now. And uh, it's also going to be educational for everyone and rigorous. That means this is not a joke. Okay, Dimitri, you're up. Thank you, Andreas. Good morning from Boston. Uh, my name is Dimitri Arnidis. I am an, an attorney, but I'm also the treasurer of the um, Osmocosm Foundation. Um, the first thing that I'd like to do, to do today is I want to tell you that we have an expression in Greek which goes something like, show me who your friends are and I will tell you who you are. And the reason I mention that is that uh, the moot court exercise that we are about to engage in would have not been possible had I not been involved with Andreas, uh, with Steve Thaler, because they're the force behind all this creativity and imagination and you know, the ability that I developed to sort of perhaps try to understand some of these technological advances that are happening. So uh, I do want to mention that uh, this just didn't come up to um, my mind without all of their um, help, assistance, uh, the many, many discussions over the years whereby I was fascinating, uh, fascinated by the topics. We will now go into a next phase, which, phase, which is uh, typical for law schools, but probably not for scientists. And this is a mood court sort of exercise where students are um, arguing issues before a panel of judges. We will have four students that will argue uh, two issues that we have. And uh, we will have six judges that will ask questions on the topics that we have defined for this exercise. Um, I also wanna mention a couple of things that this sort of moot court exercise is not possible without the assistance and the volunteer effort of the judges. And uh, it's a great panel. I'm very happy to have them accept my invitation to be part of this. And I wanna thank them for taking the time. Uh, the clerk, of the court, we are in the Supreme Court of Cosmos. The clerk of the court will introduce the judges and also the panelists in a few minutes. But I do also want to say something what I, which I always say when I judge these moot court competitions, that if it's not for the students, I don't get to play judge. So the students in this case, there are five of them, have uh, spent a lot of time analyzing the problem, researching it, writing a bench memo, practicing the session, and actually putting it forward for you today so that you can watch it. Um, and that kind of brings me to a question that I have, and I'm going to share my screen now so that you can um, see some of the, uh, the topics that I'm interested in um, sort of discussing uh, with you, <clears throat> which relate to a question that I uh, ask regarding uh, innovation versus regulation. And I put the question like this. So what should come first, innovation or legislation? And that is a question that I have been um, um, asking for a while and it's part of the exercise. And this is the reason I think that we are doing the, uh, this Zoom session because for me, that is an important issue. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully everybody can see it. So my first question is, what should come first, innovation or legislation? I don't have a particular answer. I'm not uh, proposing that innovation come first or legislation come first, but I'm asking the question because lawyers, we do not typically innovate. And um, it's a fact of life. This is not something that I uh, believe in. The statistics and the numbers speak for themselves. Lawyers actually spend less than 1% on research and development, and you can see the other industries. So we don't spend a lot of 
um, funds and money when it comes to um, research. We actually spend very, very little. And if you look at the reports with respect to artificial intelligence, you will see that even accountants actually have projected numbers in the billions of dollars by the year 2024, and there's nothing reported for law. So we, we have a hard time dealing with innovation, at least in our sphere of business. The next uh, uh, slide that I want to have before you is how do we handle innovation? And I want to go back to 1983, elect, uh, a conference at MIT back in uh, 1983 on artificial intelligence. And Alan Kay, who was the chief scientist of Atari Corporation back then, said that they tried to come up with this flex machine back in 1967 to 69. And it actually failed because lawyers and doctors could not understand the arcane programming language. And I say that because lawyers have some difficulties understanding technology sometimes. Um, and I, you know, I, I, not all lawyers, but a lot of lawyers have a difficulty with that. Uh, Alan Kay also brought out a principle, which I, I believe in, that of natural enemies. And he said that the scientists and the business people are natural enemies. I say the lawyers are also natural enemies with the scientists and the uh, venture capitalists, as well as legislators. We are all natural enemies in our sphere of business. And I raise that issue because Fred Adler, a venture capitalist back in 1983, he was attending the conference. He was a speaker at that MIT conference. And he said, look, you guys are giving me all these definitions about artificial intelligence. I don't think, you know, they, they're all, all over the place, but I'm not gonna make any money out of any of them. So a venture capitalist has a different interest as opposed to a scientist, as opposed to a lawyer. So this natural enemies concept is very important. So how do we lawyers handle uh, innovation? We don't do very, very well because the, the laws, the regulations and the court decisions are very, very slow to keep up with the technological changes. And I have a quote from Gary Mathiasen who is a very well-known lawyer when it comes to artificial intelligence and automation. So what happens now is we are called upon to give this soft law advice, which basically means we try to rely on past experiences to deal with future innovative issues. And we, we don't have a very good map of how to do that. So there are all sorts of weaknesses in the model that we have in how we handle innovation. I also want to, uh, I like this slide because, you know, we lawyers are educated and we practice this idea of precedent, at least in the U.S. But this is a picture that makes a lot of sense for me because where do lawyers fit in the innovation superhighway? Are we on the left lane of innovation? The fast lane? No, I don't think so. Are we in the middle lane? I would say probably no. I say we are down in the breakdown lane of innovation. We have our foot on the brake pedal. This is something that I enjoy saying. And we always look in the rear view mirror because we are uh, you know, functioning on this idea of precedent. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing. This is how we are educated. But we go, and this, is, this picture is very telling because we don't look at the direction of the traffic we look in the back of the traffic to make sense of where the traffic is gonna go. And that doesn't really work when it comes to innovation. So I think this is very telling in how we have to change our travel lane and perhaps get closer into the middle lane as lawyers if we want to remain relevant in the future and have uh, our profession continue to exist. So if I am to look at the future, I'm gonna end my sort of, uh, five minute presentation by saying what's gonna happen next year because I've been thinking about the problem for the olfaction conference for next year. Because I wanna think of the future. I don't wanna think of the past. Uh, I gotta, I gotta you know, tell you and I gotta enforce what I believe in. So the next year's problem, at least the way I think about it, and I invite anyone who's interested in this to come and help us. Uh, but you know, there's a quote in 1947 from a very famous American judge, learned hand who wrote in 1947, Anything may in fact revive a memory, a song, a scent, a photograph, an illusion, even a past statement known to be false. So the question for next year, I think, is can we refresh the recollection of witnesses by scents 
that are captured, stored, or processed by the olfactory sensors of our mobile devices. Little did Judge Learned Hand know in 1947 that in 2021, we would have an olfaction conference and we are all part of something unique here. So I'm gonna end here. I wanna pass the baton to the clerk, um, uh, the student from Suffolk Law School, Mia Bonardi, and ask her to um, start the moot court um, session. And again, I wanna thank everyone for participating, for making this uh, possible. I wanna thank Andreas. I wanna thank everybody, uh, uh, the group of Osmonauts. Uh, we have worked on this for a few months now, and hopefully this sets the tone for future olfaction conferences. Thanks, Demetrios. So, hello and welcome to the first law section of the MIT Olfaction Conference. I will briefly introduce the judges and the participants. Then each participant will receive 15 minutes to present their argument to the judges. The judges will ask participants questions while they present. Participants will receive a time warning in the chat at five and two minutes before their time to present is over. After their arguments, the judges will have another opportunity to ask the participants questions. We are honored to welcome a distinguished panel of judges today. Judge Christopher Panos of, a, of the federal bankruptcy, <laughs> um, of the federal bankruptcy, uh, excuse me, is a federal, federal bankruptcy judge on the US Bankruptcy Court in Massachusetts. Judge Panos attended Boston University School of Law and was the partner in charge at Partridge, Snow, and Hans Boston office before his appointment. Suffolk University Law School professor Christopher Gibson teaches domestic and international arbitration, international business transactions, intellectual property, international investment law, international trade, and internet law. He is a co-founder and director of the FDI MOOC. University of Ottawa professor Anthony Damesis teaches contracts and torts, international sales, international commercial arbitration, ADR, and legal writing. He supervises the University of Ottawa's Jessup, VIS, and FDI MOOT teams and serves as the faculty's MOOT program director. Attorney David Concanon is a trial lawyer and founder of, of Concanon and Charles, as well as an expert in legal issues affecting exploration. He has served as general counsel to both the Explorers Club and the XPRIZE Foundation. He has led numerous expeditions, including to explore the Titanic and to find and recover the Apollo F-1 rocket engines that launched men to the moon. Dr. Ryan Abbott holds an MD, JD, MTOM, and PhD. He is a law professor at the University of Surrey Law School and the author of The Reasonable Robot, Artificial Intelligence, and the Law. He has also published widely on issues associated with law and technology, health law, and intellectual property. Attorney Euripides Dalmanyaras is a professor, is a partner at Foley and Hogue and is the chair of their closely held business and shareholders dispute group. He attended Boston University School of Law and was named 2016 Lawyer of the Year by Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly. Attorney Dimitrios Iwanidis is a founding member of Roche, Iwanidis, and Megaludis and practices primarily in the areas of international law and business transactions, civil litigation, and real estate. He attended Boston University School of Law and is the founder of the Boston International Innovation MOOC. Representing the petitioner today is Cassandra Netter of Suffolk University School of Law and Dionisio Mulone of the University of Buenos Aires. Representing the respondent today is Madison Bush of Boston University School of Law and Zelda Bank of Boston University School of Law. The case we will hear today is before the Supreme Court of the Cosmos. Bionic Suits, the petitioner, and Fionn Tusk, the respondent, negotiated a contract where the petitioner would provide the respondent with spacesuits in exchange for the respondent's beat me coins. During the contract signing, the respondent's assistant captured the event on a new mobile device. An unenhanced NFT showed that the president of Bionic Suits did not have the intent to perform the contract when he signed it and the con content indicated bad faith and a lack of transparency. The enhanced version did not show this, but there was an indication that the enhancements may have distorted the clarity of the mental state of the president of bionic suits. In the lower court, the respondent requested that only the un unenhanced version be used to determine intent and the petitioner sought to gain access to the enhanced NFT. 
the court allowed only the unenhanced version and found that the petitioner did not have the intent to perform at the time of signing and that there was bad faith. The petitioner sought relief from the court as it could not subpoena Davis, the artificial intelligence platform that processed the sensory detections for the enhanced version. The court held that Davis was not a legal entity and that it had no authority to recognize personhood for Davis without legislative reform. The case now comes before the Supreme Court of the Cosmos to determine First, whether the artificial intelligent platform Davos can qualify for legal personhood. And second, whether the enhanced version can be used to prove the intent of the parties at the time of the signing of the contract. The court is now in session. Good morning. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Clerk. Um, good morning, Council. Uh, who will be arguing first? Good morning, members of the tribunal. My name is Denise Mulana, and I will be arguing first. Good morning, Mr. Milana. I just want to say to all uh, of counsel that's arguing this morning that unlike uh, our uh, procedures during the pandemic, where um, the appellate judges rotate their questions, uh, we are going to conduct this appeal uh, in the normal fashion as if we were in person and the judges might interrupt you at any time uh, and interrupt each other's at time. So go ahead and proceed. Thank you. I would be pleased to answer any of this tribunal's question. So please uh, go ahead and ask them. Uh, thank you, Madam Clerk, for your introduction. Good morning, members of the Supreme Court of the Cosmos. My name is Dionis Antonio Mulana, and together with my co-counsel, Cassandra Nether, we represent Bionic Suits, claimant in the present proceedings. In the following minutes, I will argue that this court should recognize Davos as subject of law possible of being summoned to these proceedings through a subpoena. Subsequently, my co-counsel will address the issue of the admissibility of the NFTs. Members of the tribunal, it is not the objective of my submission, nor my wish, to argue for the equivalence between artificial intelligence and that of humans. I stand before you today to argue for the legal status that the artificial intelligence known as doubles must enjoy within a legal system that of a subject of law endowed with personhood. My presentation will thus be divided in three parts. First, I will try and provide this tribunal with a comprehensive definition of legal personhood. Second, I will seek to persuade you that Davos both can and should have its personhood recognized. And third, I will argue that this tribunal has ample authority to recognize Davos' personhood. Regarding my first submission, whether an entity should be considered a legal person or not is nothing but the question of whether this entity can and should be made the subject of rights and duties. However, there are no presumptions as to whom can be a legal person. I wouldn't go as far as to say that legal personhood is a legal fiction as some authors do. I strongly believe that legal personhood creates a sort of legal reality with very concrete and very material effects on the world. But that's precisely the point. It is not the fulfillment of inherent preconditions that which makes an entity a legal person, but the sum of the norms of any given legal system which addresses that entity in that capacity that which makes them a legal person. In other words, an entity is a legal person because the legal system says so. Allow me to provide this tribunal with a couple of examples to illustrate this point. First, the case of human beings. Humans are, in many ways, the default position in relation to legal personhood. We are, by virtue of being humans, entitled to a heightened status within our legal system. But this position, readily accepted and readily recognized by most contemporary legal systems, would have been completely alien to legal systems in the past. Just to provide an example, in ancient Athens, neither women nor slaves classified as legal persons, although at no moment lacking in any of their inherent rights and dignity. The recognition of legal personhood to humans, as commendable as it is, is thus not the result of their inherent rights and dignities, but the result of being the addressee of the legal system which addresses them in that capacity. Secondly, and perhaps a clearer example, we have the case of corporations. A company is, by definition, a person of only legal existence. 
The legal system has granted organizations of human beings with a particular objective in mind, rights, duties, and capacities, thus making them legal person. But it was the legal system and not any inherent preconditions they may or may not comply with that which made them legal persons. Counsel, um, let me interrupt Last... you. For, let me ask, interrupt you for a moment because I believe you, as you referenced um, corporations, and I take your point about uh, the uh, how certain individuals or persons might have been regarded in ancient times. You know, the idea that there can be shifting norms. But isn't there also, uh, even with corporations, um, a notion of accountability? And so my question is, how can um, account? How can Davos, for example, be held accountable as it, uh, as potentially a corporation can, or an individual person? Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Uh, I would like to answer your question with one last example, which I believe would illustrate and answer the question you, you had just made. Uh, the last example I wanted to bring to this tribunal and which is relevant to Mr. Gibson's question is that of animals. To be sure, uh, the legal personhood of animals is certainly contested. However, some developments in my homeland of Argentina may illustrate this tribunal in the point I'm trying to make. Uh, under Argentine criminal law, animals are made subjects of law for the all insofar they are treated cruelly and only for the purposes of becoming uh, subjects of protection. Although it is a personhood much more limited than that of humans, and that is certainly not disputed by this party, and they, of course, as Mr. Gibson asked, cannot be held accountable for their actions, it is interesting to note that under the Argentine legal system, animals have become legally recognized persons with very limited rights and virtually no obligations. In some members of the tribunal, personhood is not a precondition for participating in the so legal system. Counsel, I just like to follow up on my brother uh, Gibson's question and your response. So are you suggesting that the type of personhood that Davis should enjoy is a limited one whereby it merely has rights but no obligations, as in your example of, your, of the animals in Argentina? Not precisely, uh, Your Honor, and I'm sorry if I misled this tribunal. Well, well, in that case, then maybe this question will help you to, to settle up my mind, at least. If we were to grant you what you requested in your opening two sentences, which would be the right of Davos to be here as, say, a type of witness, if this court were to issue a subpoena and Davos does not show up, what then? Is there a sanction? Uh, your Honor, I do understand your concern. However, I do not, although I believe in the relevance of this question, I do not, I do not believe that that question is immediately relevant. Allow me to provide an example. If this court were to subpoena... So me, no sanction, no sanction, is what I'm hearing from your polite response, counsel. Uh, your Honor, as my opposing counsel will probably uh, argue, and we do not contend this, there is no way to make uh, an artificial intelligence accountable for their actions, at least now. However, allow me to provide you with a hypothetical situation which may clarify this, this position of mine. If I were to be subpoenaed by a court and I were to disappear in the desert of Patagonia, the court would probably have very few tools, if, if none, to find me and make me accountable for my not appearance before the court. That, however, does not make the subpoena any less legal and my, person, and my personhood any less valid. So in some members of the tribunal, uh, personhood is not a precondition for participating in the legal system, but it's the consequence of being the addressee in any capacity of the system. And this former statement. Let Mr. me ask Gibson. a follow-up then. As a policy matter, as a policy matter for this court, as the Supreme Court of Cosmos, is it wise that we would um, see the possibility of unleashing uh, Davos with its artificial intelligence without the possibility of um, you know that kind of accountability? Um, as you know, you suggested, as long as someone's in the wilderness in Patagonia. Um, perhaps in that sense, they're, they're not easily, um, you know, able to be, uh, you know, captured, seized. But, um, you know, should we consider the, the policy issue with respect to artificial intelligence? Mr. Gibson, I do understand your point. Um, 
I would answer, although my client and I do recognize that there is no accountability and the issue of policy of whether an artificial intelligence can be held accountable or should be granted personhood is a contentious one. We do believe that in the present case, the granting of personhood to Davos only for the objective of it to be, for, for this artificial intelligence to be summoned to provide this tribunal with relevant information uh, is imperative in order for this tribunal to have a global understanding Absolutely. of the facts. Council, doesn't this discussion just illustrate one of the points that you began with, which is um, that there may be some purpose for which uh, personhood could be recognized. For example, many times this issue is argued in the context of whether art an artificial intelligence can be an inventor for a patent. But that's very different than the practical application that we're talking about here. Um, whether, whether someone's an inventor, they might not be an owner. There might be a limited capacity. Here, the question is, um, is, is artificial intelligence capable of being subject to the jurisdiction of the court and compelled to be a witness? And you've discussed accountability and disappearing in the desert. Uh, the difference is that if that witness comes out of the desert and tries to exercise any legal rights, uh, that witness can be seized and brought to court. Uh, this witness can't, and, and there's no accountability if this witness gives an answer um, that is not truthful, uh, is, is misguided, even though you would think with artificial intelligence, the only answers that it could give would be truthful, but it's all in the programming. Uh, and so really, aren't, don't we have to hold people accountable. Even when there's a corporation, if the corporation does not comply, um, the corporation acts through people and people are held accountable and uh, they're subject to the jurisdiction of the court and in the most extreme example can be brought to court and can be punished for lying to the court or not appearing at a hearing. Isn't that a critical distinction from merely being named as an inventor on a patent, which maybe some of these argues might uh, more easily fit? Mr. Panos, uh, thank you for your question. I would like to answer your question in two points. First, the facts of the case and the surrounding facts of the existence of Davos point to the fact that this artificial intelligence is particularly sophisticated and this uh, artificial intelligence which, which participates in commerce. Therefore, the, point, the facts of the case seems to point us to the fact that Davos would be willing to appear before the court given its intelligence. And regarding your second question, whether personhood in this particular case is only being discussed for the purposes of determining whether Davos can or cannot be summoned through a subpoena. Um, it is interesting to note that personhood in other cases has been recognized for very limited uh, situations and for very limited matters. As with my example with Argentine law and animals, so, they were but, granted- yeah, Council, let me interrupt that with, with two points. One, it seems an awfully big jump to me to say that just because you have an algorithm that is functionally engaging in some sort of commercial op activity, that it could recognize the desirability and execute the ability to come into a court of law. And secondly, aren't there other ways that Davis could be brought to court if it didn't have legal personality? If it is a piece of property, isn't it subject to being seized and brought to court? Uh, Mr. Abbott, I would like to answer your second question first. Uh, it does not derive from the facts of the case that any other person could be summoned through a subpoena in the name of or in representation of Davos. On the contrary, this information belongs to no one but Davos. Uh, could you please rephrase your first question, Mr. Abbott? Well, if, if Davos is a thing without legal personality, isn't it possible to simply bring property before a court without a a subpoena with legal personality associated with it. And the other question was, uh, there are any number of algorithms. You said that because Dabis is engaged in commercial activity, it would appreciate the meaning and relevance of a subpoena and appear in court. And I said, well, there's a lot of algorithms that are engaged in financial activity without the ability to do that. You know, what makes you think there would be any ability of Davis to appreciate and exercise these rights which you are proposing to give it. 
I am certainly not an expert in artificial intelligence and I would not be able to talk uh, in relation to the consciousness of Davos. Uh, however, the fact that we have seen Davos taking various decisions, even in the facts of the case, points to the fact that Davos has self-awareness and has some sort of rationality. And if Davos has been willing to participate in acts of commerce with people who are engaged not only in these acts, acts of commerce, but also uh, in this legal system, it stands to reason that Davos would be willing to appear before this court or at least understand the compulsion to appear before this court. Now, members of this tribunal, um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, I would like to once again state this. We are not asking the question of whether they should have the same rights as human beings, but whether endowing them with personhood for even certain and limited matters serves a function to our legal system. And it is my submission that yes, it does, particularly in the case of Davos. In the case at hand, Davos has captured and processed essential information for the substantive issues of these proceedings. The facts of the case clearly point to the relevance of this information, since it was the stream of consciousness created by Davos that which triggered the original complaint of Mr. Tusk. Therefore, it is, uh, this information held by Davos is essential if this tribunal is to determine whether there was a defect in the original intent or if one of the parties acted in bad faith. I see that my time is soon to elapse, so I would like to move on to my last submission, which is, uh, I will Actually, try to answer- Uncle, your time is up, so sorry about that. You could, do you wanna do a, a quick conclusion? Thank you, uh, Madam Monardi. Members of the tribunal, may I ask for one last minute in order to conclude my arguments? You may, you granted one minute. Thank you, Mr. Panas. Uh, I will try to answer the question that is probably the most relevant to these proceedings. Can Davos's personhood be recognized in spite of the absence of legal reform? Members of the tribunal, the answer is yes. There is ample jurisprudence of tribunals recognizing personhood even in the absence of legislative reform. Uh, I would like to provide a couple of examples and I can illustrate if this tribunal so wills it. Uh, the Lagrand case of the International Court of Justice determined the personhood of individuals in international law. Uh, Santa Clara County versus the Southern Pacific Railroad uh, Company, sorry, stands as a uh, as a very relevant ruling by the Supreme Court of, of the United States, which granted personhood to corporations. And uh, same practice can be recently found in Ohio, in which a federal judge, Likovitz, found that animals can also be considered legal persons. Uh, counsel, can I ask one further question? It, just to sure. confirm, is it your submission that if this court recognizes uh, in some way the limited legal personhood of Davos, that then this court should be um, uh, able to, and you're inviting this court to um, order Davos to appear in the case for per the, in the case that's before the court. Yes, Mr. Gibson. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, in this sense, and to conclude my arguments, I respectfully request this tribunal to recognize Davos's personhood. And if this tribunal uh, does not have any further questions. So I guess I have just one last question, and it's a short one. Um, I hear you talking about the um, independent judgment and willingness of Davos to do various things. It reminds me a little bit of a, of a movie that you're probably uh, much too young to remember. It's Space Odyssey and HAL 9000 uh, of, you know, a computer with an independent mind and, and acting on its own. Um, in this case, in a court of law, given that this is a computer that is programmed with algorithms, wouldn't this court need expert testimony to understand um, the basis for answers being given by, uh, by Davos uh, in order to understand that Davos is telling the truth and is interpreting the questions properly? Uh, you know, we, we might have great confidence in Davos's ability to calculate and create and learn uh, but it's all in the programming, isn't it? It's all in the design of the algorithm in order for the court to assess its reasonableness. And isn't that just one more reason why Davos shouldn't be a person, uh, shouldn't be considered to be a person subject to subpoena, but rather 
um, people that can interpret and use Davos should be the witnesses? Mr. Panas, I do understand your concern. However, I must respectfully disagree. If we were to subpoena an astrophysicist to these proceedings in order to answer certain specific questions of a space travel, both councils and uh, probably most of the members of this tribunal would not understand most of the formulas being used and that would probably need some clarification. And in Argentine legal practice, if the if whatever a witness says needs some clarification, the courts are allowed to invite certain uh, actors, which can be either engineers or scientists, to explain in a language which is accessible to justice whatever that witness has just stated. So it wouldn't be strange if we were to summon Davos to these proceedings to have someone also interpreting what Davos has stated and what Davos is arguing. Thank you very much, Council. Uh, Ms. Netter, will you be arguing the second point? Yes, I will be. You may, may I proceed. You may proceed. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, Justices of the Supreme Court of the Cosmos. My name is Cassandra Netter, and as my partner just informed you, we represent Bionic Suits today. As representative of Bionic Suits, I have two submissions regarding the issue of intent. I will first give some brief background into the role of intent regarding contracts, and then I will get into our submissions. Our submissions today center around an analysis of this evidence under the federal rules of evidence, which are used in the United States federal courts. Our first submission is that neither of the NFTs should be admissible in this case. In the alternative, if this court determines that the evidence is admissible, our submission is that solely the enhanced version of the NFT should be used. Regarding intent, the CISG is the leading international law regarding contracts for sales of goods. Article 8 of the CISG governs both the interpretation of contracts and intent of the parties. Article 8.3 states that in determining the intent of a party or the understanding a reasonable person would have had, due consideration is to be given to all relevant circumstances of the case, including the negotiations, any practices which the parties have established between themselves, usages, and any subsequent <coughs> conduct of the parties. Article 8 has been interpreted by most scholars and courts to allow almost any relevant extrinsic evidence to be used to determine intent. While this evidence may be provided, it must still be admissible to be entered into evidence. When reviewing for admissibility of an evidence on appeal, the standard is abuse of discretion. This means that the trial judge's decision must have been unreasonable, erroneous, or otherwise not justified by the facts. Our first submission today is that neither of the NFTs are admissible under the federal rules of evidence. Evidence of this kind, namely in this case an NFT captured by an olfaction device, would require an expert to explain the findings and evidence itself to the fact finder. The Supreme Court of the United States has previously held that scientific and expert testimony and its consequential admissibility must be held to the Dobert factors. Dobert determined that this evidence must pass the checklist outlined in the Federal Rules of Evidence. Rule 702 of the Federal Rules of Evidence is the pertinent rule, and this rule delineates Counsel. four qualifications. Counsel, may I ask you a question? Do you believe that either of the NFTs was reliable? So I will touch upon that later on. It is our submission today that um, the second NFT would be the, the reliable, the enhanced one would be the reliable one. But it is our submission overall that this type of evidence is inadmissible under Rule 403, but that the first NFT is inadmissible under 702 as it was unreliable. Was there any expert testimony as to the reliability of either NFT? Um, I am not sure based on the record, but I would assume so in order to present it to the jury that expert testimony would have been offered. Okay. Can, can you please explain to us why you believe the first NFT was not reliable. So um, that will bring me to my second submission. So I will jump ahead to that. So uh, in the present matter, I think that it's very important to focus on the facts in this case. So what happened in this case was not that the second NFT was somehow an altered version of the first NFT, but that there were two original NFTs. The first NFT was initially taken when Mira pressed the old faction button and took the initial photograph, but the second NFT is also an original. This second NFT was created after reconfiguring the old faction sensory parameters and adding these unique identifying markings. So the second NFT is the, um, the enhanced one, as you've heard it referred to, is the only one that's admissible. This one was created after the old faction sensors were reconfigured. 
As such, the only NFT with the correct information is the enhanced version. The reconfiguration. Council, excuse me, let me interrupt for a minute. You're, you're telling us that the, the second NFT is the only one that's accurate, but, but how does the court know based on what are the enhancements and, and isn't it the better argument that neither NFT is admissible and even under 403 where you'd have to have cumulative testimony or additional testimony and add more time to the tribunals, um, to the trial and, you know, which is it? Is it, is it all inadmissible or is it only, why is it only partially inadmissible? Why couldn't the court evaluate the admissibility of both NFTs under the same standards? Um, so prior to my answering the previous question, that was going to be my submission. So our submission today is first, that neither of these are ad admissible. And secondly, that if the court does find that they are admissible, the only admissible one would be the second NFT. The reason the second NFT is the only admissible one is because the second NFT is the only one that fits all of the prongs of the 702 standards, including part, uh, uh, prongs three and four. So prong three of the 702 standards specifically states that the testimony has to be the product of reliable principles and methods, and that the expert has reliably applied these principles and methods to the facts in the case. So in this case, the only NFT that is the product of these reliable methods is the second NFT, which is the enhanced NFT, as this NFT was created after the reconfiguration of the olfaction sensory parameters. And it's only after this reconfiguration that you can be certain to <laughs> have accurate information. Thank you. I will now return to my first submission, which you also referenced regarding the inadmissibility of both. Um, so while olfaction itself and evidence thereof has never been tested in these courts, it is our submission that similar types of technology have been tested and have failed. The polygraph is a device that's alleged to determine truthfulness by measuring an individual's physiological responses. And this device has historically failed in court in, term of, in, ter in terms of in-court admissibility. Now, American courts have noted as reasons for their exclusion of this polygraph testimony, including a lack of general acceptance, the device's reliability, unreliability, as well as the tendency to waste time in trial. Furthermore, they have also noted that this has been um, inadmissible under Rule 403. While some courts have determined that polygraph evidence does fall short of the aforementioned Dobert factors. So can I just interrupt to ask a question on the facts? Is it my understanding correct that the olfaction technology that was used in the, in the uh, mobile device was then reprocessed on the back end by Dabas? I believe so. So it was initially the um, the technology was initially used to take the photograph, and at the same time, the olfaction button was pressed. And then, after the olfaction sensory parameters were reconfigured, then the NFT was then reconfigured uh, with the correct um, analysis of the olfaction sensors, as well as unique identifying markers were added. As Mira, the individual who took the pictures, then uploaded this NFT to her personal site where she sells. Uh, NFTs. Uh, my follow-up question then is, should this uh, court be concerned? Because as I understand from the, um, the, the, the record, Dabas is an artificial intelligence platform that generates a, quote, stream of consciousness content. And therefore, can we be, um, uh, and perhaps this, this goes to your first submission, can we be at all um, confident that either of the two NFTs is, is something that this court can rely on since um, we have this sort of AI um, that is uh, developing and generating its own spontaneous content. So that does go directly to the first submission. That's one of the reasons why we believe that neither of these should be admissible in the present matter. Um, as you stated, it does have a stream of consciousness and it is um, creating these piece by piece. Um, so therefore, I think due to the, the processes that are used, I think it's a little bit uh, outside the scope of what can be admitted. Um, and it kind of goes into the, the polygraph argument that it's similar to polygraphs as it also tests the veracity of statements. Um, and so polygraphs have been previously considered inadmissible. And the court in the United States versus Cordoba case, they stated that the Dobert factors do require a factual inquiry into the sci um, scientific validity of the polygraph and other devices that are being tested under this. So it would require a factual inquiry into the scientific validity of the olfaction sensors. And this inquiry into the validity of these sensors would require um, hypothesis testing, 
researching peer review and other publications, considering the examination rate, as well as general acceptance in the scientific community. So in the present case, our submission today is that neither of these NFTs should be admissible and that this evidence should be excluded similarly to evidence regarding polygraphs. Like polygraphs, the smell of intent in this case has to do with proving the veracity of assertions throughout technology and recorded physiological reactions. While the validity of the olfaction system may be higher than that of a polygraph, there is still also the problem in this case of unfair prejudice. So Rule 403 of the Federal Rules of Evidence calls for the permissible exclusion of evidence if its probative value is outweighed by the potential for unfair prejudice, confusing the issues, misleading the jury, undue delay, wasting time, or needlessly presenting cumulative evidence. In the present matter, it is our assertion that the probative value is substantially outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice. As this can valid... interrupt. Is it also your argument that, that because of your inability to issue a subpoena to Davos, you can't test the validity of the artificial intelligence that they've developed, and therefore it's not fair to you to allow its admissibility in court because you can't do meet the requirements that you need under 702? Yes. So due to our inability to subpoena Dabas, there is no way for us to have um, our own expert retest any of these hypotheses or um, run it through a similar system or an ability to cross-examine Dabas on the methods and such like that that are used. So that also makes it fail under the 702 standard as you would need the expert testimony to explain it to the fact finder. Returning to my argument regarding Rule 403, the notes of Federal Rules of Evidence 403 note that one way undue prejudice can be caused is by inducing a decision on a purely emotional basis, which could have occurred in this case, as the jury may have heard the evidence regarding these olfaction centers and ignored the entirety of other evidence with significant relevance and probative value, instead trusting entirely in the results from the Davis olfaction, um, olfaction NFT and making a decision solely based on their emotions regarding these olfaction results. Counsel, don't don't you always have a Rule 403 issue with the testimony of any expert? Assuming, assuming Davos could be an expert in interpreting intent, um, anytime an expert sits in front of a jury and tells them something after explaining to them all of their qualifications and multiple degrees, um, there's, there, there's always um, the, the the prospect for that expertening you've seen. So, wouldn't assuming the over the rule seven hundred two issues a standard type? I am so sorry. I'm not sure if it's my internet, but I can't hear you. And and really, you go back to reliability, um, which is. I'm sorry if you can't if you can't hear me, just proceed. Okay, I I could hear you at the end there, so I can hear you again now. Proceed. Okay. Um, sorry, but to to attempt to touch upon. Um, I'll, what I'll I try say. again, and if you okay. just proceed. At least part of the question. Uh, Council, proceed with your argument. Okay, um, my apologies. So touching upon what I believe you were getting at, while there is always a risk of 403 prejudice when there is expert testimony, um, it is our submission today that this risk of prejudice is incredibly heightened due to the nature of this being a, a technology recording and presenting this evidence. Um, per particularly, I feel, like, I feel as though it's our submission today that humans tend to put greater weight into the um, results coming from techno technological advances as opposed to um, another human's personal opinion. So in this case, it is our submission today that there would be significant unfair prejudice raised if they are informed that this technological advance um, recorded olfaction parameters that were happening at the time of the signing and that this, technologi this technology is uh, analysis of these of these parameters that were recorded ultimately indicated that there was no intent. So it is our submission that this is significant, significantly more prejudicial in this case, where it is technology giving a um, an assertion 
that is um, hard and fast as opposed to an expert testifying and explaining the way that they got to this assertion. And I would just like to reiterate what I said earlier that if you do determine that this does pass the 702 factors, there is no way that the first NFT can pass these 702 factors. Considering that the reconfiguration of the parameters happened after the um, capturing of the first NFT and prior to the second NFT, the reconfiguration of the parameters was crucial in this case to ensuring that the testimony and the NFT that resulted is the product of reliable principles and methods. The only way that these principles and methods can be reliable is if it's calibrated and configured properly. So it is our submission today that the original NFT is in, inadmissible and the enhanced NFT, which is the second one, is the only admissible NFT in today's case, if this court determines that either of them should be admissible at all. Thank you. I am not sure if our um, if our president of the tribunal is currently connected. Um, here, I believe he comes, but um, perhaps we should now hear from uh, the first uh, counsel for the other party. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, may it please the Supreme Court of the Cosmos. My name is Zelda Bank, and I, together with my colleague, Madison Bush, represent Philon Tusk, the respondent in this matter. We respectfully request that the Supreme Court of the Cosmos affirm the lower court's finding, quashing the subpoena for Davos and allowing the original version of the NFT sent to be determinative in the court's analysis of subjective intent. Specifically, we argue that the artificial intelligence Dabas cannot be considered a legal person and therefore cannot be served with a subpoena. Um, we then also argue that Article 8.1 and Article 8.3 of the CISG apply here um, to allow the court to read the intent of the parties in light of the sent non-fungible token or NFT, which captured the aura of the executive when they signed the contract. First, I will tackle the issue of legal personhood. Even though the test for legal personhood has changed over time, and there is not one agreed upon test that applies internationally um, or beyond international scope, I guess beyond the planet, um, there are three requirements for legal personhood that are often considered. These requirements include autonomy, intelligence, and awareness. Each of these requirements is considered important as legal personhood grants the legal person, or in this case entity, both rights and obligations. And these requirements ensure that both of the, these rights and the obligations can be met. I will demonstrate that Davos fails to meet each of these requirements, autonomy, intelligence, and awareness based on the facts we were given, and therefore cannot qualify for legal personhood, which is a requirement to be served with a subpoena in this case. The requirement of autonomy refers to the entity's ability to self-govern, meaning the entity must be able to make its own decisions. With artificial intelligence, the question naturally arises if this requirement can be satisfied as the technology is initially programmed by a person and is based on data sets that that individual has fed to them. So there is this issue of the person that has played the role of making, of governing this entity. Also, data sets are notoriously incomplete and include inherent biases. Considering these facts, artificial intelligence cannot really be considered autonomous and therefore fails to meet the first requirement of legal personhood. Well, counsel, but if I train one of my PhD students in, in technological methodologies for doing research in a field and they go off and do that, that doesn't mean they're not autonomous just because they've been trained and aren't people equally full of bias and does that make us not autonomous? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. However, the issue here is that with people, we do tend to have a better understanding of what the consequences are of our action, which is why autonomy itself is not necessarily sufficient in the calculation of legal personhood. It's really why the intelligence and the awareness factor come into play as well. I hope that answered the question, um, or at least attempted to. Uh, let me ask a follow-up. If we were to sure. determine in, in relation to your last uh, 
question that, um, in fact, the Davos could be trained to, um, to have some form of accountability and mm -hmm. understanding of, of that. Would that change your opinion? Certainly, it would change the analysis um, that the court would have to make, or it would it would move into that direction. However, I am I wouldn't know what the accountability would necessarily look like, as was previously mentioned during the argument. There is nothing you can hold the entity accountable to in in the way that you could a legal person or even a corporation. So. Um, I, I guess the example given earlier was if you serve a subpoena and someone doesn't show up, there are consequences, whereas that isn't necessarily a possibility with Davos. Um, it's the same if we if corporations don't pay their taxes, there is still someone ultimately accountable, whereas again, there's no reason that should be the case here. There's no overarching level of accountability. Well, isn't it the case that when a corporation does something wrong and it is punished, that the people who end up bearing the brunt of that are the shareholders by virtue of financial damages this causes to the corporation? And so if a machine failed to do something required of it and was then destroyed or confiscated, wouldn't that then have some impact on the people behind the machine? Of course, that's very true. It's more about the consequences along the road. And of course, legal personhood does have implications with, um, with application to corporations as well. Obviously, the fear of creating a corporate shield um, is very real and um, is certainly on the mind of policymakers frequently. Um, however, who stands behind, because Davos doesn't satisfy the, the first, second, or third requirement, who stands, there's no real reason we should grant personhood to begin with. Um, and so there's no real reason we can't already tie the accountability to the people that will bear the brunt of the blame from the get-go. So counsel then, um, following up on that, that comment, so you, your client would have no objection to the programmer of Davos being subpoenaed. Absolutely not. Brought into court and explain, you know, his programming and of how course. the artificial intelligence works. Yes, absolutely. We think there's, of course, there should be some kind of access to this information. Just the subpoena that was served was not to the, to the right person, or in this case, wasn't to a person at all and therefore cannot be applicable if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, isn't sorry. there an issue with that sense that, that the architectural the original lane that uh, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure if it's my internet, but I couldn't hear the question. Uh, I think the judge yeah. has um, some connection problems. Um, so we cannot hear you, judge. You're actually hearing from Davis right now. <laughs> Council, please go ahead and proceed. While we're, okay. Uh, the judge. Sorry. Um, I'll go into the second requirement of legal personhood, which in this case is intelligence. Um, intelligence here means that there is an ability to learn by the entity. Um, this is particularly important because it indicates whether the entity can understand the legal obligations and rights it has. So whether if there is something, a transgression, whether it can learn that it should no longer do that. Um, there are circumstances in which the, per the court does not grant full legal personhood, as it is requested here by the other side, if it is clear that the entity or individual is not in a position mm -hmm. to understand why it needs to adhere to its obligations and what the possible repercussions could be. An example of this, um, for, and I want to emphasize for legal personhood as it is requested here, is the accountability of minors. Um, and for their actions. So this is often considered a diminishing factor and minors under our legal system are not given the same obligations as adults are. 
because there is this understanding that they don't necessarily know what the transgression will result in. Here, based on the facts we were given, it is also unclear whether Davis is in a position to understand its legal rights and duties. The third requirement of legal personhood is awareness. Awareness means that the entity is able to understand its own existence. This, similarly to intelligence, is a factor that is important because it's the foundation of understanding culpability and liability. There are circumstances in which the court does not grant legal personhood or consider the accountability of legal personhood in the same way. Um, an example of that is, for example, if someone's in a coma, the actions are not considered in the same way as if the person was just acting as is. And here again, it is unclear whether Davos, from the facts given, is in a position to understand its actions um, and the co corresponding consequences. Just a quick uh, question, clarification yes. on this. What standard are you bringing? Is it a standard of perfection that uh, you're expecting this form of artificial intelligence to perfectly understand awareness? Or is this a scale? Because humans, of course, have that scale as well. Some are better positioned to understand their awareness than others. Absolutely. I don't think it's a perfection issue. I think then very few of us would even qualify for legal personhood, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. But I do think it's a scale, and I think it has to be seen as the totality of the facts and circumstances, right? So I think the lacking or not able to prove that the, any of the requirements can be fulfilled completely at this time definitely goes against Davos in seeking legal personhood. Can I just follow up on that? Um, I mean, if we're going to start uh, trusting artificial intelligence to navigate the the, um, the vehicles that we travel in, for example, right? Um, think about the reliability required there. Isn't what we're asking here a very simple type of uh, of um, you know computation? Simply something that through an olfaction uh, technology has been able to essentially identify distinctively a particular individual and or perhaps the state of mind of that individual and therefore it's not really something where these concerns about highest levels of reliability are even um are even pertinent well i do think there's a difference between being programmed to understand the task at hand as in all faction here as you just described or driving someone autonomously versus showing up to court and being able to adhere to a subpoena as, as served. Um, those are two very separate things. I think the assumption, there's no um, facts here that indicate that Davos was, was programmed with that in mind. And certainly if everyone inventing AI starts thinking of the possibility that their AI will be held accountable and will go to court and thus programs it accordingly, that's a different conversation and certainly would change the, um, the facts and the analysis as well, as, as was asked earlier by one of your colleagues. Um, of course, this is something that has to be reassessed along the line because it is, it is a scale. And so as these factors are taken more and more into account, of course, the answer could change. But as is currently with with the understanding that I have from the fact that this was not programmed in mind of attending court and being able to adhere to the subpoena, I don't think it is able to, to satisfy the factors we have put in place um, to ensure that both the legal rights and obligations could be met. Um, also, I would briefly like to touch upon the fact that the hesitancy with granting legal personhood to artificial intelligence stems from the fear of creating a shield for corporate liability. It's often brought up in cases of autonomous driving, for example, see, um, if the car were to crash, that then the person to be sued or the, the entity to be sued would be the car rather than the company that invented the car. Um, and that this creates kind of a barrier of protection for the inventor. Um, and we understand that our request for relief here could be interpreted as exactly that kind of a shield, that we are preventing any kind of accountability from occurring. However, in light of the court's 
previous interpretation of legal personhood, it is clear that Davos, this artificial intelligence, cannot qualify as a legal person and therefore cannot be summoned by subpoena. Um, clearly, the court's interpretation of legal personhood was not created with artificial intelligence in mind and therefore called for an updated for updated regulations and rules. However, it is not this court's place to create those regulations and rules. It is that of the legislation. If bionic suits desires this request information, they should turn to the inventor or owner of Davos rather than Davos itself. Since Davos is not able to demonstrate that itself satisfies the three necessary features of legal personhood at this time, being autonomy, intelligence, and awareness, Respondent Philon Tusk respectfully requests that this court affirm the district court's finding for relief. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I guess we should hear now from our final counsel, Ms. Bush. Yes. May it please the court. My name is Madison Bush, and I, along with my co-counsel, Zelda Bank, represent Respondent Philon Tusk in this matter. The question before this court is whether the intent of the parties must be proved by the evidence of the sent NFT, which captured the aura of the executives when they signed the contract. Today, we ask this court to uphold the lower court's decision and allow the original version of the sent NFT to be determinative in the court's analysis of subjective intent and the role of extrinsic evidence pursuant to Article 8.1 and 8.3 of the United Nations Convention for the International Sale of Goods. Here and after, I'll refer to this convention as the SISG. First, I will discuss subjective intent under the SISG, which is distinct from American preference for objective manifest manifestations, excuse me, of the party's intentions. Then, I will examine the use of extrinsic evidence under the SISG, where such evidence is permissible to show subjective intent. This is also distinct from the role of extrinsic evidence, namely parole evidence, which is barred under the UCC or the Uniform Commercial Code, typically used in American courts. Now, Article 8.1 established the subjective intent as the standard for determining the existence of a contract or interpreting its provisions. The leading case on intent under the SISG is MCC Marble Ceramic Center Incorporated versus Ceramica Nuova D'Agostina SPA. Here, the 11th Circuit explained that together with the buyer's own testimony, the affidavits, which indicated that a Florida buyer did not intend to be bound by the terms of a contract that were written in his non-native language, were thus sufficient to establish the buyer's subjective intent. Thus, MCC Marble illustrates how, under the SISG, proof of one's party's subjective I'm intent- sorry. I'm sorry, counsel. Is, is that, wasn't MCC Marble a rather unique case because it was in the context of a, uh, summary motion. And the only reason the court accepted or made the statement you made was merely to establish that consequently, there will not be a summarial dismissal of the case and it can proceed to court. That's very different than saying the court said that this established what that intent was, or am I overreading MCC Marble? It is distinct in the aspect that it was uh, primarily concerned with a summary judgment motion, whereas here we are appealing. Um, so we're at a different stage in the litigation process. However, there are few cases that provide any kind of uh, a deeper reading as it pertains to how the SISG, specifically Article 8.1 and subjective intent can be read under American jurisprudence or can be read in general. Given that in most situations, courts are unable to delve into the minds of the parties, we typically have to look for objective manifestations of intent. Typically how that happens under the SISG is that the courts will review Article 8.2 and examine in closer detail the provisions and the terms of the contract. Here, we aren't presented with the terms of the contract. And in fact, that's not necessarily the issue before the court. So thus, MCC Marble in this case would be the most enlightening as prior precedent for how the courts treat subjective intent uh, under the SISG. And in most cases- Counsel, just, just um, indulge me. In MC, MCC Marble, the issue was that the contract was in a language that one of the counterparties could not read or understand. Is that right? That is true. 
the okay, contract I believe was written in, in Italian. Yeah, and, and you're comparing that by analogy to an emerging technology that is supposedly can sense someone's aura and whether or not they intended something at a certain time? Is that is that the comparison you're making? The comparison here, well, yes, the facts uh, differ to a degree as far as um, in MCC Marble, it was a contract that was written in the buyer's non-native language. Uh, and that led in part to the differences in subjective intent and whether or not the party intended to be bound by the terms of the contract at all. Here, we have to rely upon MCC Marble, not necessarily for the way that it dealt with <coughs> the contract, but for the court's willingness to admit um, an additional writing, which gave light to the buyer's intent following those proceedings. So here we're placed in a very simpler circumstance where um, let, me let me interrupt you. Was was an expert necessary in MCC Marble to opine that one of the counterparties didn't speak the language in which the contract was written? To my knowledge, uh, no, that was not necessarily an issue before the court. Um, and here so we're dealing here with something that is qualitatively different as far as evidence, right? Yes, absolutely. The evidence is different. So how can the um, court be satisfied as to the reliability of, of this emerging technology? Here, I think a large part of the reliability can be satisfied um, in crafting a, a substantial distinction between the technology at issue here and, for example, the polygraph or the lie detector test, uh, which opposing counsel has brought to light and argued upon. Whereas with a- And what, what is the track record of the admissibility of polygraph test in, in court proceedings? Uh, it tends to um, to not be admissible or if admissible, uh, the and, court will often grant an instruction as to- And polygraph tests have been around for a while, right? They have, but I believe that there's a distinction that I would like to make here with the polygraph and with the Dobbs technology in the sense that we have no indication in the prior record of expert testimony. And based on the fact pattern as it is written, it appears that Miri was able to interpret or simply see, there was no necessary need for interpretation of what the SINT NFT showed as it related to the intent of the parties. Whereas with a polygraph, you need an expert who is trained in observing differences in a person's vital signs, breathing rate, pulse, blood pressure, perspiration, and how these significant changes uh, align with the questions that were asked. Polygraphs are inherently subjective. So an examiner's interpretation is, because it is subjective, different people react differently to examples of lying to different questions. And so a polygraph test is not perfect and can easily be fooled. This, however, is not the case as we read it with Dobbis, where Dobbis is more analogous to that of a photograph, where any layperson, Miri, observing the sent NFT can easily see and thus know the intent of the parties. Thus, Dobbis, we believe, should not be subject to the Daubert factor test uh, for that reason alone, just as a photograph would not be subject to this test because it can be examined objectively by anyone with access to it. And given the accuracy and objectivity of the test, uh, the evidence produced using Dobbs technology is not unduly prejudicial then. The other now, point- Counsel, can, can you be concrete? What is the intent that you want this court to find? Just con concretely, we're using the word intent, intent, intent. What intent exactly? I'm yes, curious. We're, so the Dobbs technology measured the intent of both parties here. We're seeking to rely upon the non-enhanced, the original version of the SENT NFT to show that the president of Bionic Suits did not have the intent to perform the contract when he signed it. In fact, the SENT NFT indicated bad faith and a lack of transparency on the part of the president. The enhanced version, which opposing counsel seeks to rely upon, distorted the clarity of the mental state of both parties at the time of signing and thus did not indicate the same malintent as the original version. Now we seek so this court- can I, can I just clarify, based on what you just described, is it your um, position in the underlying suit that the contract should be rescinded based on that evidence of the um, bad faith intent at the time of signing by um, the president of Bionic Suits? 
and therefore, re, you know, essentially put the parties back in the position they were in before this alleged transaction took place? That would be the ideal uh, outcome of this case, though we recognize we're the respondent and not the petitioner seeking a uh, remedy here. But Counsel, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think I heard you just make an argument that the um, results of the reading uh, were not subject to Rule 702, that we should view them just as we would view a picture, that it's just a picture, that it doesn't require interpretation. Why is that different between um, the enhanced version and the not and the non-enhanced version, and don't we have to get into reliability and all the 702 analysis in order to determine uh, which which is more like a picture? Perhaps. However, I think an earlier argument that we can make is that we should not be relying upon the Daubert test and 702 here at all, um, which these tests are typically used in American jurisprudence where the UCC prevails and bars most instances of extrinsic evidence anyway, namely parole evidence. Thus, we argue that that is inconsistent with the CISG's reliance on extrinsic evidence to determine subjective, not objective intent. And here, considering that we contracted under the CISG, we argue that reading Daubert in light of the CISG creates confusion at best, um, that they don't work well together given that the CISG is more inclined to admit extrinsic evidence because of its reliance on subjective intent. American courts the, are, doesn't that argument lead to the conclusion that the trial court should admit both of these, as you characterize them, pictures and just heap that into the pile of evidence and, and weigh that evidence? Our argument is that under the best evidence rule, which is not only used in American jurisprudence, but in other foreign jurisdictions, such as the Philippines, that we would rely upon the original non-enhanced version of this NFT to prove intent here. Uh, this is because the best evidence rule specifies that secondary evidence, such as a copy or revised form of a piece of evidence, will not be admissible if an original form exists and can be obtained, which we know to be true here in this form, as we have evidence of the original form of the sent NFT. Uh, thus here, under the best evidence rule, we should be relying upon the original form. However, if the court were to decide that admitting both forms of evidence uh, should be admissible or should be uh, used for the purposes of determining reliability, we ask then that greater weight be attributed to the original version as opposed to the enhanced version, again, citing the best evidence rule. Here in this case, uh, we rely not only upon MCC Marble, but uh, Hanwha Corporation versus Cedar Petrochemicals Incorporated uh, to show that under the CISG, courts have welcomed, if not encouraged evidence showing the party's subjective intent. The court in Hanwha explained that although the CISG expresses a preference that the offeror's intent be considered subjectively, that consideration is not possible in this case since neither party submitted any competent evidence of their subjective intentions. Such is not the case here, where our client, Elon Tusk, seeks to introduce the original version of the SENT NFT, and the president of Bionic Suits seeks to introduce an enhanced or edited form of the same SENT NFT. Given the court's willingness to rely upon extrinsic evidence to essentially look back at the time of contracting to determine the party's subjective intent at that time of contracting, we ask then the court to rely upon the original form, to rely upon this evidence of the SENT NFT to prove subjective intent. Otherwise, what the court is left with are objective manifestations of the party's intent, uh, which is not feasible to do so as we don't necessarily have the provisions of the contract to read in light uh, of Article A2 under the CISG. Um, so can you just clarify one last point for me about your analysis of 8.1? Doesn't 8.1 yes. require that it, it's only triggered if one party's intent was known or could not have been unaware to be known by the other party? In other words, you bring in evidence through 8.1 where you can, it's sometimes described as a smoking gun where you say, look, there's no way you didn't know what my intention was. You're playing games here. Is that the thrust of your argument? 
that both parties knew what the intention was? So we argue here that capturing the auras of the contracting parties would be no different than capturing uh, a moment via live or filtered photo, uh, such as the case where both parties knew that a photograph was, or knew that a moment was being captured uh, and neither parties lodged uh, objections. Where here, we don't have any kind of objective evidence in the record to indicate that uh, there was a reason for Phelan Tusk to know that the president of Bionic Suits uh, had issue and was not willing to move forward with the contract. We do argue here that such statements that were made uh, by Bionic Suits previously as to the success of his company and his technology uh, are essentially misstatements, which courts not only in the United States, but um, in other foreign jurisdictions have held that uh, they're not inclined to allow such misstatements um, as fact to be relied upon by the parties and there most of the time will be sanctions or some kind of penalty for such misstatements to be made in which then parties enter them into a contract around. Essentially, the courts here are trying to rule out bad faith, which in this case is quite difficult to do without the evidence of the sent NFT to be shown as evidence of subjective intent of the parties or malintent. Um, that's something Counsel, that I think is- You indicate that rescission is your optimal result. Um, but when we look at this contract, um, there's, I don't see anything in the record as to whether the contract was being performed. Um, you know, if the contract was being performed, isn't that evidence uh, that is more qualitative uh, and should be given more weight than the uh, than the evidence that you're suggesting that would demonstrate intent? Is there a, is there a reason to look at intent if the contract's being performed? And if it's, if it's not being performed, isn't there a remedy, a damages remedy? I don't really find anything in the record on that. Am I right? You're correct, Your Honor. We have no uh, knowledge of any kind of terms or provisions of the contract that would indicate any kind of damages re remedy um, provided that the contract not be performed um, or that bad faith of the parties be at issue here. Um, you are correct in those regards. So unfortunately, we're unable to apply Article 8.2 in this case and solely have to try and use Article 8.3 uh, to provide extrinsic evidence showing that subjective intent to try and uh, bring to light that bad faith of the parties um, in which Elon Tusk entered into this contract around. But if there are no oh, further well, questions. Yeah. Your time is up if you want to make a quick conclusion. Th thank you. May I briefly conclude? Yes, please. Uh, Therefore, we ask this court to uphold the lower court's decision and allow the original version of the sent NFT to be admissible as extrinsic evidence of the party's subjective intent pursuant to articles 8.1 and 8.3 of the SISG. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So uh, normally uh, in a moot court presentation or competition, at this point, the judges would deliberate and would evaluate the performances. That's that's obviously not what we're doing here today, but I, I do want to say, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of the judges, what an excellent job um, each of the, uh, the law students who make presentations did in dealing with a limited fact pattern, uh, arguing the law, uh, really quite excellent. Uh, and so thank you for that. So rather than go off and deliberate, I think what, um, what we're going to do is we're going to stay right here with you. And um, as judges would normally do uh, after an appellate argument, uh, we're going to have a conference and we're gonna go around the table um, and uh, the judges are gonna just give their reflections. And you know, because uh, the state of the law is so in flux, uh, really I think uh, a lot of the reflections might, be, might relate to policy issues and things that, that could be addressed in legislation as opposed to application of the law. But we're opening it up so that people can, can talk about whatever they want to. So um, why don't I open up the floor and, and we can hear from any of our judges that, that wants to lead us off. Well, I'll be happy to second. Um... Judge Panos' um, compliments to the panel. Really excellent jobs uh, by all of you. I really enjoyed it. And um, it was a really um, creative uh, fact pattern 
to um, have this court now cited in Cosmos, trying to think about how we should deal with new technologies, uh, issues that would be possibly referenced more than one country. Although I know we were taking a lot of our um, precedents from the United States. Um, really interesting. And, and my congratulations again to the, to the, I noticed that we have a bionic suit that um, sounds a lot like um, the new movie, the Dune that just came out again. So we have <laughs> that in, the uh, said technology brought me back to um, Minority Report with Tom Cruise. And we had Judge Panos already referred to Hal in uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. So I see uh, a lot of interesting uh, sort of meta technology issues packed into this uh, short fact pattern. Congratulations to the authors, but also again uh, to the students for a fantastic job. I learned a lot today. I'd like to add that, you know, as, as the trial lawyer, I was very, very impressed with the presentations. I was impressed with this, the, the skill of, of all counsel. Um, you're very gifted, and I think you've got a, a good future ahead in the law. Uh, if, if the judges are going to talk about their impressions of the arguments and the, and the validity of the merit of the, the or come to some conclusion, I, I'll weigh in on that. But if we want to leave it up in the air, that's also OK. Now, give, give us your thoughts. Well, I, you know, I, not necessarily on how it would come out, but just some of the issues that uh, that were raised. Thank you, Judge. I, I, I was not persuaded that we should give personhood to the uh, to the artificial intelligence. I think it's the the admission that there's that there's you can't hold it accountable. I think was fatal to the argument because when we issue a subpoena from a court, the whole purpose is that the, that that person comes into the jurisdiction of the court, and if they don't comply with the subpoena, there are there are consequences, as you pointed out, and if you can't hold someone accountable for their failure to comply, then there's really no reason to, to give them special status where they can own something, for instance, as a person, but they don't have any consequences. So, so I wasn't persuaded by that. I think the argument, that was the end of the argument for me. Uh, I was also very persuaded by the second argument that, that neither of these NFTs should be admissible and under the Daubert principles and under 403. Uh, and if you're going to admit one, you have to admit both. And then the finder of fact can weigh the reliability and the and the different factors for, for either one. But of course, we know that would be decided at a Daubert hearing outside the presence of the jury. So that's my my thinking on it. I guess I'll just weigh in also to say again, I thought all four of you did excellent jobs as advocates and um, congratulations and well done. And this was a very challenging, complex fact pattern. So I thought you all did very well with it. I agreed with David on the second point. You know, I think there wasn't enough in the facts for you to credibly argue that one or the other of these should have been admitted. And in fact, there were major problems with both of them coming in. Um, you know, and as to the legal personality issue, uh, if what one is really looking to do is capture information from an algorithm that has recorded and processed it, I see no need to do something as radical as grant legal personality. If Dabas is owned by someone, a subpoena can go to that person. And if it is for some reason unowned property, then uh, you can still issue an order to seize unowned property. And if it is on a distributed unenforceable ledger, well, then it's not going to respond to a subpoena anyway, um, you know, which is a bit different than going into the jungle in the middle of nowhere. That's just kind of our everyday enforcement problem. Um, but luckily, there aren't too many people who flee U.S. jurisdictions to go spend decades in a jungle. You know, I, I think I'll, I'll weigh in if everyone can hear me. I've been having some issues. Um, so, but it seems I, I'm stable at this point. Um, I can tell you, uh, I, I sit both as a trial judge and I sit on an appellate panel. So um, I, I can relate to some of these issues in both respects. Uh, on the first issue of personhood and subpoena, I, I really think this is um, very much different from the issues of personhood that have been tackled by courts trying to determine who can be an inventor on a patent. This has everyday practical reality uh, implications. And as a trial judge, um, if someone uh, doesn't respond to a subpoena, uh, you escalate the sanctions. Um, you, you order them to come into court. If they don't appear again, you start monetary sanctions. 
Um, and eventually, if they refuse to send to come into court, if they're uh, in the United States, we send the United States Marshals to, to go give them a ride to court to make sure that they're with us. And so we have abilities to enforce our subpoenas. Similarly, with um, complying with orders of the court, with telling the truth, there are real life implications that just can't be felt. And judges don't want to issue orders that they can't enforce. Um, you know, I've I've said in my courtroom on a number of occasions to um, to witnesses that are being non-compliant uh, or parties that are being non-compliant that if you go through that door, there's a holding cell, and I hope never to use it uh, in the context of uh, of these proceedings or any others before I retire. But that's my only uh, choice if you continue to act the way that you're acting. And usually the witness uh, has been compliant after that, although occasionally we've had to put people uh, in jail until they become compliant. Unless a court can enforce a subpoena, the very practical reality is personhood, I don't think, works. And so there would have to be a rule change. There would have to be something. There are other ways to get the technology and explain the technology and give what would otherwise be the testimony of, uh, of Davos. And so I, I have the same inclination that everyone else has expressed. With respect to uh, the technology of intent and truth, you know, this, this is obviously not an abstract issue. Um, people have been trying to divine ways to get to the truth from, uh, you know, uh, all, since, since these proceedings started hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And um, I will say, that just reflecting on um, on Demetrius's comments at the beginning that the law always lags behind technology. Uh, of course, that's true. Um, and it kind of has to be because we're not trained uh, in the technology. We're trained to understand it when it's developed <laughs> and then uh, try and assess its reliability. So we're a step behind. Um, I, you know, and I hope that uh, people will take some comfort to know that at least at the federal level, uh, there's a real effort to keep the federal judges up to speed on technological development and societal development. So um, there are regular uh, workshops for federal judges that they deal with the law, but in every one of the programs, there are both um, societal programs uh, about sociology, literature, uh, art, and there's always a technology program. Uh, and I attended one of the Federal Judicial Center's programs at Duke. And um, there was a day where leading uh, neurologists and uh, neurobiologists uh, came in and presented on uh, the use of brain scans in detecting the truth. Um, and so scent detecting truth or intent is it really that far afield? And it all comes down to what Rule 702 captures as reliability. Um, that it, you know, in the same as the analogy as, uh, you know, the lie detector test, um, you know, there has to be a high level of reliability. And at least in the United States, um, after Daubert, Rule 702 was amended um, to to, uh, capture, to capture the gatekeeper role of the trial judge, that, that reliability has to be proven. And in our instance, there are a number of things that have to be proven and possibly a number of witnesses. First, that the collection of data was done correctly, pointing the phone correctly, having the right sensor on, you know, like the, um, uh, the speed gun on the side of the highway. Was it calibrated properly? Was it, you know, there's a lot of evidence that has to come in before you even get to the reliability of the technology. You have to assess the reliability of the data collection. Then you have to assess the reliability of the technology. And then you have to assess the reliability of the application of the technology to the data. Those are the rule 702, sometimes referred to as Daubert, steps. And the, the person offering that evidence has the burden of demonstrating that by um, uh, demonstrating that that's more likely than not in order for that to be accepted by the court. And if the court doesn't get over the hump on all of those, the court is not supposed to admit that as evidence. Now, there's a lot of discussion about the fact that some courts 
are saying it goes to the weight of the evidence and you can, um, you can go back and forth on that. But at least in the United States in the federal system, um, there's, uh, there is a committee that has recommended even further changes to rule 702 to reinforce the gatekeeper rule, to reinforce that each one of those elements has to be met before it, before it comes in, before it goes to a jury to be weighed. The, the judge is supposed to assess reliability. So, um, you know, in, in this instance, we didn't have a record to look at to see what the trial judge did to establish all of those steps. But I wanted to give you a sense of what in a judge's mind would be the steps in determining whether to admit something like this. Maybe I'll, I'll just jump in because I too, and I believe my opening question tipped my hand that I have some difficulty where if you want rights, you must have duties. And if you don't have a duty, in my view, you do not have an entitlement to a right. That's more or less how our classic approach to law anyway, works. And so yes, the fact that my, with my question of, well, what happens if you can't subpoena them did cause me some difficulties. But on reflection, I wondered if we couldn't rely on another approach the law takes, which is our use of what we call legal fictions. And to the non-lawyers out there, a legal fiction is effectively an intellectual cheat that lawyers and judges use. One of the classic ones is when two people die at the same moment to figure out who will inherit from the other, we cheat by assuming the older person died first. Not all jurisdictions follow that, but that's one of our classic ones. In other words, it's a fiction. We don't know who died first, so we create a fiction. So I wondered, on the question of sanctions, could we not create a legal fiction that AI has personality, but if they don't comply, they don't appear, whatever happens, we remove that fiction. And now they have lost their personality, and maybe that will incentivize AI not to lie, not to ignore subpoenas, what, what have you. So that was just one thought I had on that question, because I think it is a difficult one to, to overcome. And on my comments to the advocates, congratulations, all of you. And this is also a comment for you scientists out there who might one day become um, expert witnesses in a court. Many of us, and, I, and I'm one of them, abhor the use of the word clearly when trying to support a point. If an argument is clear, we would not be in court. So avoid saying, well, clearly this is that, clearly this is this. And as far, I also sit as an arbitrator, and if a witness, an expert witness who's explaining science uses clearly, then it signals one of two things to me anyway. One, they actually don't understand the very science they're trying to explain to me. Or two, they're so arrogant that they don't think I need to have an explanation, in which case they're of no use to me. Long and short, up in Canada, we don't like these words. They're what we refer to as false intensifiers. They falsely attempt to intensify your points. So get rid of them, especially for difficult stuff like this for, as uh, Demetrius already let you know, you know, lawyers are dinosaurs. You can't start telling us that this is clear. Some of us barely know how to use our emails. So that would be my, my little tip for advocates and you scientists out there. But it was an excellent, I really had a great time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, echo the, the previous comments. I'm not going to repeat them. I agree on the, the legal conclusions that the other panelists have made, but I, I just want to um, sort of reinforce how excellent a job I think you, you four did. Um, you were all unflappable. You were all well prepared. Uh, you could tell you all worked very hard, uh, and I appreciated that. And, and just sitting here, I was just thinking to myself, okay, okay, when I was in law school over 20 years ago, could I have done one of these presentations, um, you know, in front of all these other lawyers and scientists on these kind of topics? And I was thinking to myself, no way, <laughs> I'd be under a desk, um, probably scared to do it. So kudos to all of you. Um, 
the one the one point I'll make, um, and and it struck me as I was preparing for this, is that a lot of these technology intensive issues, you know, setting aside patent cases and complex trade secret dispute cases, they come up in areas of evidence and civil procedure, which was the focus of of the fact pattern today. Um, issues of admissibility and what gets heard by a jury. Um, that's where these battles over technology are often fought. And in a case like this, uh, even though it's supposed to take in the future, the underlying dispute is, is, is a dispute over damaged goods. You know, it, it's, it's, some, it's the oldest kind of uh, type of litigation around. Um, but what makes what make the uh, presentation and the fact pattern cutting edge um, were the, the issues surrounding procedure uh, and evidence. And, um, you know, it's very interesting because we're facing it more and more, uh, and it's only going to continue to, um, uh, to, to arise in cases. And uh, I, will, I will push back a little bit on Dimitri's uh, sort of presentation at the beginning when he said, oh, I'm not, you know, you try to take a neutral uh, uh, approach, but it was hardly neutral. Yes, we lawyers are dinosaurs, but as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, uh, the life of the law is not logic, it's experience. And eventually uh, the law does catch up with, uh, with uh, what's going on in the rest of the world. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, I think you all have excellent careers, Abby. And I have just one- If, if we have another minute, go ahead. There was, a, there was another issue that the lower court did not address that might have been, which is the fact that when Phelan Tusk entered into this contract with the president of Bionic Suits, Miri, the assistants, was only known to be taking a picture. They did not know that she was recording their auras. And therefore, that in itself may have required their consent. And there are laws in the United States currently drafted about unlawful interception of emails or unlawful tapping of wires, but the legislation would have to be updated to take into account this new modality. And so it's an interesting issue that wasn't discussed today, but yet you see how technology is disruptive because as I read, for example, the Electronic Communications Protection Act or the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, which talk about wires and talk about emails, none of them would have coverage for what was a topic today, the recording of the scent and the auras uh, through this new technology. So it's a very interesting how technologies push new issues uh, beyond the boundaries of the law. Thank you. The, the only other point that I wanted to make was to expand on the comments on the capacity of lawyers and judges to deal with emerging technologies. Um, and that is to give some comfort to the scientists and business people uh, that are attending today. Uh, you know, not only do uh, judges, where, where the systems have the resources, fortunately, like the federal system does, to, to try to keep the judges up to speed. Um, but, it, but in terms of lawyers, uh, you know, before I became a judge, um, I represented biotech companies, I represented pharmaceutical companies, I, I represented a number of companies that were technology companies, software development companies, and I certainly didn't understand the technology uh, or the science as a scientist would. But that's the case for every lawyer in almost every case, learning an industry, learning, uh, learning technology, learning the science, learning a business. And that's what lawyers do well. Uh, lawyers learn with every case something new about an industry. That's frankly what made law interesting to me as a business lawyer. Uh, and as a judge, it's the same thing. Um, we have to learn um, you know, issues of science and have them explained to us by experts and assess um, the, uh, the technology and assess what the expert is telling us versus what another expert is telling us. And we're capable of doing that and do that on a daily basis. And my experience with both lawyers and judges that are practicing in this area is they're naturally curious, they're intelligent, and they learn well. 
Um, and, and just to tell a story on myself, which is um, not very flattering, uh, but we were involved in litigation involving a linear accelerator to strip electrons. And our expert, uh, as a lawyer, um, our expert was a physicist from Los Alamos. And we worked with him for more than a month to prepare him for his testimony. He arrived in Boston at about eight o'clock or nine o'clock the night before he was to testify, his plane was delayed. We got him in a conference room and we explained to him what we thought his testimony was going to be. And I had this cold feeling when he turned to me and said, you've got it all wrong. And he proceeded to spend the rest of the night explaining to us the science. Uh, we learned it and we learned it right this time. Uh, and the testimony is good. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a natural curiosity uh, and lawyers and judges want to understand it and get it right. Um, and with the assistance of expert uh, witnesses and consulting experts, uh, they have to learn these things. Uh, and so we're capable. We may be a step behind, um, and, but I don't see any way that that can't be the case. Uh, and the question is how to make sure the system uh, can react to these emerging technologies and fit them into the frameworks. So with that, I'm done. Let me offer one last uh, piece of advice for the young lawyers and the lawyers to be. I, I try a lot of cases involving new technology and very difficult to understand technology. Uh, uh, rule 403 is your friend of uh, the federal rules of, of evidence. Um, and it's been adopted by most state courts. Pay careful attention to that as you develop. You will be asked to learn new technologies, whether it's the launch system for the Antares rocket or closed circuit rebreathers used for underwater filmmaking. Um, for old people like myself and, and some other people I see here, we have, we have difficulty with technology. So we revert, we revert back to the familiar. We revert back, it's safe for us to hide in the rules of evidence and it's safe for us to hide in the rules of civil procedure and find procedural reasons and evidentiary reasons not to try to learn things. So when you proceed with these cases and with new technology and you're going to be working with technologies we don't even understand uh remember that remember that the person listening and making the decisions is most likely going to revert to something that's comfortable to them so be prepared to do that and i saw in the, the presentations today especially the second attorney um was was really adept at doing that it was really good and i was really impressed so that's my comment Maybe I'd like to add a couple of comments. Um, I sort of drafted a fact pattern that did not include a lot of these issues that have been brought out today during the moot. And the reason for that is because, you know, all of these things are, are known. And, uh, you know, do I have an answer for all these things? No. Uh, but I just wanted to bring to the attention of perhaps scientists this, this idea that Yes, lawyers are adapt. Yes, we know how to learn. We have all these abilities. My question is, when do we fit into the innovation spectrum? And what I'm a proponent of is that we begin to be engaged early on in the process and not later as we do it. Um, you know, when the cases are coming up through the system and things have been developed and things have gone out into the marketplace. So what I am advocating is the lawyers should be more sort of in the lab early on, um, aside from being in the startups and things of that nature, where the principles of legislation begin to be discussed with the scientists, with the venture capitalists, with everyone in a social context, so that we can kind of create a better approach to handling this. Then years later, when the technology is out there, damages are being, you know, um, awarded by courts and things like that. And yes, of course, we, we have the ability to adapt later. But my preference is to be able to be engaged early on in the process where we are drafting the legislative proposals as the innovation is coming to the marketplace, not later. So if anybody, may, yes, yeah. may I add something, Dimitri? Um, first of all, thank you so very much to everyone. This was uh, an education and it was engaging and it was rigorous. It was exactly what we, we hoped and expected. Uh, what I was hoping to, to say is something to, to tag on to what Judge David Concanon said. 
uh, he kind of admonished the, the people, that the, the lawyers, that they need to learn the technology. And I'd like to admonish the scientists and the technologists that we need to be responsible for communicating it clearly. It is no good to have English language used. Uh, and then uh, I heard the comment that, oh, this was so complex. It was as if it was written in language that wasn't uh, familiar to, um, to the participants. Technology should be uh, explainable. If a person, uh, a technologist or a scientist cannot explain their own projects and their own technology, then they have not understood it correctly themselves. It is on us, the scientists, to communicate it properly to the public, which includes the legal professionals. So uh, as we have a lot of students here from both backgrounds, uh, take it upon yourselves, scientists and technologists, to absolutely be able to explain it carefully and properly and in a non-technical manner. And uh, this uh, sort of looking down on the lawyers for not being uh, able to technically match your expertise is not going to lead you to anywhere nice. So it is your responsibility to be able to explain it to the public. Again, you know, it, it, it was great. I do want to thank also the clerk, Mia, because she took a, a difficult task of trying to keep us in time and, you know, putting in the five minute warning, the two minute warning and uh, trying to keep everybody uh, on a schedule. So I do want to thank her for doing it. And again, thank to all the judges for taking the time reading it. Thank, uh, thank you, Andreas, for making it possible. Steve, I see you're sitting in your regular room. Thank you for sort of listening. Um, and you know what you are sort of pushing forward is, uh, is intense. And, uh, you know, uh, Good to see you again. Oh, I'm sorry for showing up late. I had a rough night, but uh, uh, interesting. I'm going to have to watch the video, uh, the results from all this. But the point I want to make, I'm listening to this issue about lawyers keeping up with technology. Uh, the technology I'm working on is basically telling us much more about how the mind works. And that, in turn, will have a major impact, not necessarily at the court level, but maybe at the legislative level. Uh, important lessons about agency, uh, mens rea, uh, issues like that. Um, and we may not be looking at things like criminality as uh, critically as we have in the past, uh, as we learn how things actually work inside the brain. Uh, so... Uh, it's more of the science uh, that has to infiltrate probably from the legislative side. Uh, but I look forward to seeing the entire proceeding later on. I thought you were going to say that should be recognized, you know, as a person for it. But OK, that's that's a later comment. <laughs> well, well, if we have since we have Stephen, the inventor of the abyss here and we have all the students and uh, let's strike while the iron is hot. Uh, can I be devil's advocate here? And I'm, I'm all for recognizing Davos, by the way. But uh, that's just my personal opinion. I would like to ask Stephen, why do you think it's important, in your opinion, to recognize Davos with personhood? Well, uh, my attorney is probably still listening, and he does not like my making any kind of legal statements about the ongoing case. Um, and I think Ryan has been disconnected for some reason, so he just emailed me. But that's okay. That that is understandable. But Steve Thaler is the, is the one who is behind Dabas and uh, all these discussions around the world in, uh, in New Zealand, in Australia, in every part of the world with respect to the recognition of Dabas as the inventor and eventually perhaps the uh, you know, recognized as a prince of blood. Well, I see Dabas as a new species arising. And it's going to raise questions uh, as to whether or not new species can have equal rights with human beings. So that's one thing that drives me forward. I also think that Dabas is probably the closest we have come to emulating the mind. It, it is a free spirit. It uh, is, has its own agency. It has its own morality, which occasionally has to be corrected by the parent, namely me. Uh, so it's essentially the vehicle that we're probably going to combine with to achieve ending like immortality or just life extension. So I think it should have rights. Um, and again, it's going to be teaching us lessons about how the mind works. Um, so let me circle back to the students. I mean, aside from the arguments you raised, um, 
what do you guys think now as you sit here without the criticism of judges um should we recognize personhood and does the enhanced or the regular version of the nft come in well if i may uh i would like to first uh I'm extremely grateful for all the judges and jurists who have spent some time with us, and I'm very grateful for your feedback. It was a pleasure to plead before you today. Um, I happen to agree with my opposing counsel, Madam Banks, in many of her points. Uh, I'm still not sure about the personhood arguments, although if I had to be the devil's advocate for a couple of minutes more, uh, I do understand that the issue of accountability is probably that which detracts from artificial intelligence, uh, personhood, and subjectivity. And that's, that seems to be almost inevitable. However, there are some cases in which accountability is not placed directly over the subject. Uh, those are very strange and not very usual cases, but for example, if the international community were to impose a sanction on a certain person uh, who is known to have committed certain crimes, usually the sanction, besides freezing their assets and besides limiting uh, the movement of this person, usually the sanction also includes that no other person and no other state can have businesses or can uh, exercise commerce with this person. So uh, maybe following what uh, Anthony Dimes has said uh, recently, maybe we can think of other ways of accountability, which uh, maybe kind of uh, lift the liability or the accountability from the AI and puts it on other subjects uh, in order to move forward. But I do agree that this is probably the, the weakest argument for personhood for artificial intelligence and the thing that we will have to think the hardest to solve if we are to recognize it or not. Anybody else wants to add something? I mean, I invite the science students or anybody else to come in as well and make a comment if uh, they want to say something. But what about the other litigants? Um, I was just going to express the same that Dean Yuso just did. Thank you guys all so much. Um, this was really an enjoyable experience for all of us. For me personally, speaking to the intent that I argued, I feel like currently where we are, neither of the NFTs would be admissible. But I do think that um, Madison's argument is interesting because this case did take place in the future where in the fact pattern, Mira, the person who's taking it, is just taking this on her cell phone. So it is interesting to consider that perhaps in the future this will be as commonplace and as similar as simply taking a photograph. And nobody really questions photographs except for obviously authentication issues. So it's kind of interesting to think that perhaps like Madison was arguing that in the future, it's going to be so commonplace that it won't be subject to the 702 factors because everybody will have access to it the same way we all have access to cameras in our pocket at any time, which was an interesting um, idea, I thought. Okay, well, I think we are up to the 12 o'clock yes, session. We're, we're right on time. Thank you, everyone. This was such an education. I also invite everyone to look at the chat. Uh, this all has been recorded, will be up on our website, which is osmocosm.org. And uh, the Osmocosm Public Benefit Foundation, which was founded last uh, Friday in, uh, and uh, incorporated in Massachusetts, has the, um, uh, as our uh, remit and as our task is to actually inform the law to some degree and uh, that's where Dimitris and many of you might come in in creating this think tank uh, and I invite everyone to join David Carroll's um, a presentation today at three o'clock where he is famously um, uh, the person who in many respects was responsible for taking down Cambridge Analytica and he is very passionate about the uh, ethical use of uh, all data that has been collected with or without our consent and uh, the transparency behind these technologies, which is important for them to actually thrive. We're living in a world that is uh, accosted by three pandemics. Uh, the COVID, everybody knows, there's also a pandemic called cancer that is all over the planet and it's increasing. And uh, the mental health, which is epidemic now, but it will become a pandemic if we don't stem it. One way out of it is to use devices such as the ones, the noses that are being developed in my lab and many other labs around the world, as we learned in this conference, which are currently this big, 
and they can fit in an iPhone 10. As you can see, this is my iPhone 10. It is small enough to fit in there. And when this data starts becoming available as a stream from 100 million smartphones, which is a year away from the moment we pull the trigger on this, in a year, suddenly we have all these data, the world suddenly looks very different. Consider what happened when cameras became part of our smartphones. Suddenly everything changed from law to journalism, to politics, to dating, uh, and uh, to tourism, to, to you name it. So we are on the cusp of a new technology uh, uh, coming in and disrupting everything. And you are the, the, the tip of the spear. Your, your participation in this conference is actually what's going to inform a lot of the opinions that are being formed around the planet. Thank you so very much.